Hello and welcome everyone to our presentation about uh, defense and depth techniques for modern web applications. There's a couple of really cool features in the browser platform that basically support developers to build like a safety net in case uh, that the primary defense mechanism fail. And, you know, especially for sensitive applications like, you know, Gmail or banking sites, you really want to have some second layer of defense uh, in case something went, goes wrong, right? Uh, briefly about us, uh, this is Michele, I'm Lucas. We both from uh, Google Zurich. Um, and yeah, I think it's our third or fourth time here at Hack in the Box. Uh, we're always here, uh, super awesome. And um, we're basically working in a special focus area at Google. So we basically try to fit, uh, you know, mitigation techniques into our products you know, like Gmail or these big products, they're here uh, for a long time and it's not trivial to basically retrofit them and enable some f things like CSP or other stuff, right? Um, yes, so we have a pretty long agenda today. Uh, we first will talk about content security policy because this is something we have been working and contributing to for the last uh, couple of years. And uh, yeah, we built up quite some knowledge there. We wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, then we'll talk about sub-resource integrity, same site cookies, site isolation, corp, uh, from origin response header, uh, and then some probably upcoming, uh, very promising uh, new uh, techniques like sub-origins, origin policy, uh, and feature policy. Uh, so, but for now we'll start with content security policy. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about CSP. Uh, it has been around for quite a while. I think, I don't know, almost 10 years. It's uh, really complex and there's a lot of uh, misconceptions around it. And we basically wanted to bust some myths here and wanted to demonstrate and uh, explain some best practices, how to really roll it out. That is like an effective defense, especially for cross site scripting. So CSP is a response header. So it's basically sent from the server to the client and the browser takes that header and basically allows the developer to restrict uh, certain features in the web platform for that application. And we use that to basically mitigate cross-site scripting. Uh, it is very important to highlight here that this is like not a replacement for careful input validation and also not a replacement for output encoding and it's a basically a second layer of defense, right? It's not something that you would roll out as your only line of defense. Unfortunately, we right here that some, sometimes, right, from pen testers that they find cross-site scripting and then they, they report it to the company and they say, oh, we have a CSP, it's blocked by the CSP, so, but we might don't fix the access, right? So yeah, you have to fix the underlying bugs, right? It's like really a second layer of defense. So what is CSP not? I already said it. It's not a replacement for secure coding practices. And it's also not a mechanism to prevent data exfiltration. I have a slide on that particularly later, uh, but this is also a common misconception which we often see uh, around CSP. Uh, CSP is actually super complex. Uh, it's, as I said, it's around for a long time and they kept like, uh, you know, adding features to the spec and uh, in the end, it basically can do a lot of things, but uh, not all of these things work, you know, it's, it's not trivial and it's also not intuitive, unfortunately. Um, so I only had a place on the slide for like six use cases. Uh, I think there's more. Uh, most promising and most prominent one is probably uh, using CSP as a defen defen uh, defense in depth protection against cross-site scripting. Uh, you can also use it to protect against UI level attacks, right? Um, there are some really sophisticated attacks with uh, styles you can do. Uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, a keylogger, a password keylogger uh, uh, using style sheets later on. Um, so you can use the style source directive to uh, mitigate that. Then there's a couple of things that are basically not really related to CSP, but they basically use uh, CSP as a delivery mechanism, right? So for example, there's like upgrade insecure requests and block all mixed content that is like somehow in the HTTPS realm. It's quite useful, but personally I consider these, uh, you know, not really in the 
core focus area of CSP. Also, uh, frame ancestors is uh, something that they probably just added to CSP because it's a nice uh, transport mechanism and you can, uh, you know, have you have more granularity of what you can specify in frame ancestors compared to uh, the, the framing headers. Um, and then there's also some use cases where you basically just want to send a CSP that blocks everything. Uh, that can be a mitigation if you're hosting like uh, user provided content uploads, right? And you basically want to make sure that they basically never execute. Then you could, for example, set the block all header. And last but not least, uh, some people also try to prevent data exfiltration with CSP. Uh, unfortunately, this is doomed to fail, but a lot of people still do that. And uh, I have a slide on that as well later. So I just recommend to you, like, don't even try. It's it, in the best case, it slows down the attacker, but it's not a real uh, mitigation, right? Um, so in our talk, we'll mostly focus on the XSS part because this part is already complicated enough, and we could probably fill like two or three talks just with these topics here. Um, there is about three flavors of CSPs that uh, can be used to mitigate cross-site scripting. There's the very popular whitelist-based CSPs. Uh, you basically have uh, a list of hosts or origins that you allow the site to load scripts from. Uh, we have been talking about uh, this case, uh, this particular form of CSP in the last year and the year before, and it's kind of inherently broken, unfortunately. So what we usually recommend these days is using uh, non-space CSPs or hash-based CSPs. Uh, very quickly about the whitelist based CSPs, I really don't want to spend too much time on them, but uh, they're basically broken, and uh, there's a research paper which we submitted in, in the November 2016, and it basically has like a lot of bypasses for whitelist based CSPs in general. And we basically found out that like with like some list and some rules, you basically can bypass like almost 94% of all the web's uh, uh, whitelist based CSPs. Like we, we crawled, we used the Google crawler and crawled like for all the policies we could find. And they were really not uh, strong mitigations, unfortunately. So what we propose instead is using non-spaced CSPs. Uh, they're quite different compared to the white-based white, white based ones. Uh, they basically are, what is really nice, they're always the same for every site. So you don't have to come up with a new CSP for every deployment. Uh, you basically just have a nonce token that changes for every response. And that should be unguessable by the attacker, right? like an XSRF token. So the idea is the token is the random number, the random token is in the header, and the random token also has to be in every script tag on the page as uh, in a nonce attribute. And only if the nonce attribute matches the nonce value in the header, that script will be executed. Um, it's really nice because it's significantly less fragile than the whitelist based CSPs because uh, with the whitelist based CSPs, you have the problem that, you know, if some path changes, your site breaks, right? Um, the non-space CSPs is much more robust because you basically nonce the script text directly, and then it doesn't matter if the content changes or the, the, the source of where the script is loaded changes. Um, and it also does not have all the whitelist based bypasses, which is a really nice feature. Uh, super quick recap, how does a non-space CSP work? Uh, on the left, we have uh, money.example.com. <laughs> it is served with this content security policy, which restricts uh, script source. And the browser basically allows these two scripts to execute, like it's an inline script and a source script. They both have the right, correct nonce attribute value that match the header value, so they execute. An attacker, on the other hand, does not know the nonce value in the header because it's basically a one-time token, right? Every response has a new value. So he can not inject a script with the correct nonce tag and uh, nonce attribute, sorry, and the browser will basically block these executions. That's the, the basic idea behind it. Um, so what's the problem? Uh, non space CSP is actually around for a while now, but it is almost not used in the public. Um, the big problem is that it is very, very hard to nonce every single script tag. 
especially it is hard if you don't control the entire JavaScript landscape, right? Uh, if you, you if you load Google Analytics, if you load a I don't know a Twitter widget or a like button or something that you source from a third party, uh, you basically don't control if these source scripts then load child scripts. And you basically cannot launch these trial scripts, right? Because the, the source code is out of your control. You load it from a third party site. So that breaks. If it breaks, you cannot roll it out because, I mean, it's a defense in depth mechanism and you want to have a functional application after all, right? So uh, strict dynamic is really, really useful here because it transitively propagates trust from initially trusted scripts to child scripts over certain APIs. Uh, this is really a game changer. Uh, so you'll see later on the slide, we basically, because of that, we were able to roll out the strict CSP policies with, which are non-spaced on over 50% of all outgoing Google uh, text HTML traffic, right? Which is, is really massive, right? Because it's like uh, a lot of applications. And with the previous widely spaced model, which was even also insecure, that would have never been possible. Um, yes, so. This is how strict dynamic works in theory. The green box shows a script tag in the HTML markup. It is nonced because it comes from the server, right? But this script then creates a child scripts via document create element and then later a document body append child. And usually without strict dynamic, this script would be blocked from running because it does not have the nonce attribute set, right? But because of strict dynamic, it is allowed to run the child script, uh, the bar.js. And this basically makes like module loading work, like widgets work, and it's really useful. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, prominent or like very common DOM XSS uh, patterns like document write and uh, document body.innerHTML or internal inner HTML is not allowed to create scripts, right? Because they basically take unparsed uh, text and, uh, you know, uh, that's a very common sync for, that's like, a very common reason for, for cross site scripting DOM XSS. So uh, this is great, right? It allows you to roll out a CSP. There's one culprit here. You really need to make sure that in this case, uh, this, this parameter, the uh, uh, script.source is not user controllable, right? Because if the user can control that, it basically bypasses the, the CSP. Uh, that's a trade-off for making it deployable, but it is a good trade-off, in my opinion, because you basically get rid of a uh, reflected, stored, cross-site uh, scripting, and a big portion of the DOM XSS, right? So um, it's strictly better than not having a CSP. So uh, as I said, it can get pretty confusing. So if you dive deeper only on the nonce and hash-based CSPs, we can have like a, a pyramid with different levels of security guarantees and on the one hand and the different levels of like deployment difficulty on the other hand. So at Google, we basically use like these uh, level one policies mostly. These are like non-space CSPs with strict dynamic and unsafe evil. Uh, the nice thing is, especially in our case, it's really easy to roll them out because we have uh, very good templating systems that are context sensitive and that basically automatically nonce all the script tags on the page. So quite often it's just a matter of like turning it on in the framework and it works out of the box. And it gives us some pretty good guarantees for the amount of work required. Uh, as I said, like stored reflected XSS is mitigated, uh, XSS uh, through like JavaScript URIs is mitigated and most of the DOM XSS vectors are mitigated. Um, since we uh, most of the Google applications are based on Clojure, uh, we did not have uh, any strict dynamic bypasses on the Clojure application yet, which is also uh, quite good. But you know, ideally, we would move up the pyramid. Especially, evil is something I really dislike, and we are basically working on like refactoring the usage of evil uh, to can basically such that we can basically block it entirely. Because if you remove unsafe evil, you basically also get rid of the attack vectors that are uh, based because of uh, based on like uh, putting user input into evil. 
And then in rare cases, we really control the entire JavaScript stack, right? And uh, where, I don't know, maybe new applications, you can try to have a nonce or hash only policy without any strict dynamic, but it's really restricting because uh, you cannot use any third party widgets or anything else, right? But some applications can do it. Uh, and yeah, on the right corner, I put widely spaced TSPs because uh, they're almost impossible to get right. There's some uh, exceptions to that rule, but it's, it's, I would not try it. Um, this is basically how it looks like. Uh, we use ba uh, this base policy. We also restrict object source and base arrive because that would be common bypass patterns. And if you go up the pyramid, uh, these uh, keywords get removed like ANSI feeble and strict dynamic. Um, yes, we also wanted to update you with some new upcoming features in CSP3. Uh, there is uh, unsaved hashed attributes, which is uh, coming. Uh, it's uh, really interesting because uh, you often have the problem that if you roll out a useful CSP that does not have unsafe inline, you have to remove all the inline event handlers. For example, uh, on click do submit, or you know some use like uh, link link tags with JavaScript equals void zero or JavaScript colon void zero for backward compatibility to make a link tag render or rendered as a link in all browsers. And uh, first, it can be a lot of work to refactor these, but that's not a problem. The problem is if you have some third party code that creates elements with inline event handlers, you basically cannot enable CSP because these will break as well. And unsaved hashed attributes basically expands the concepts of hashes for CSP to these uh, inline event handlers. So in this case, you will basically generate the hash for do submit and you add it to the policy and then this one would also be allowed to execute. It's, uh, does not have many downsides, but in theory, you could reuse these event handlers. Like you could inject a new tag that says, a new image tag and that says on error do submit. So that is something that is possible in this uh, uh, attack model, but you would not get direct script execution, right? But you might could build in interesting constructs. But one really cool thing about that is that this is the first time that basically allows you to generate a CSP on the fly. So if you, for example, have a static content that is not uh, user influenceable, you could basically have a proxy that uh, nonces all the script tags and hashes the inline event handlers. And by that, you could basically, uh, you know, restrict a big uh, portion of the DOM XSS attack surface of like, static content sites, fully automatic, without having to manually refactoring them. Uh, this is something we're very interested in and uh, will, you know, try to deploy in the coming months. So we haven't tried yet, but it might, might be promising. And then there's another interesting one, which is uh, unsafe inline attributes. This is uh, not spec'd yet, but it's a proposal. Uh, it came up again because uh, very recently there was a CSS uh, keylogger that used uh, style sheets, uh, like, queer, like selectors to steal passwords from input fields. And it's actually really cool what you can do with CSS, right? So if you have the cycles, you can also try to re restrict style source, right, with CSP. But in some cases, it's even harder than restricting script source because uh, it is extremely common to use inline styles, right, on pages. And refactoring all of these uh, is a lot of work. And uh, again, if you have third-party widgets, you cannot refactor it, right? So what you can do is with unsafe inline attributes, you can basically blanket allow all inline styles. Um, that's not great, but there is a significant improvement over unsafe inline in general, right? Because if you just have unsafe inline, it's like if you don't have any protection. If you have unsafe inline attributes and still hash or nonce the actual style blocks, uh, it is an improvement because uh, uh, in contrast to, uh, to scripts, the style attributes are actually uh, significantly less powerful than the style blocks. So you don't have the selectors in the style attributes, so you cannot carry out these kind of uh, fancy attacks with CSS, which very often rely on uh, very powerful constructs like uh, selectors. 
So this is one attack vector you could uh, mitigate with that. You know, I ideally you would just refactor all the inline styles and just hash announce all the style blocks. But, you know, it might be a stepping stone to go there. Uh, yeah, and one slide on why we don't recommend to use CSP to prevent data exfiltration. We added this slide because we have seen this quite often and it's usually not a good idea because the TLDR is once you have a JavaScript execution, you can basically, uh, you know, you basically have the whole web platform at your hands, right? And it's so powerful and just so many ways to exfiltrate data if you have, once you have JavaScript execution, that it's basically, the CSP is not powerful enough to prevent that basically. So one very trivial example is you could, uh, an attacker could just write a, a link tag with the document cookie uh, in the path and that then click that link. Uh, CSP cannot restrict navigation, right? So there's, even if you block everything with your CSP, there's like no way to, ex to prevent this data exfiltration once you have script execution, right? And there are other examples like post message, DNS prefetch, window.open and others. So the goal is really to prevent the script execution in the first place, not to prevent data exfiltration once someone has a script execution, right? So uh, two slides about CSP at Google. I already mentioned last, in like during the last 12 or 18 months, we basically were able to ramp, out, uh, ramp up uh, CSP coverage to over 50% of all the outgoing uh, uh, Google traffic like text HTML, Google traffic. And we focused on uh, sensitive stuff like uh, account login, Gmail, Docs and Drive and stuff like that. And uh, we're not there yet, right? There's still a long way to go, but the goal would be to basically enforce it on all new launches and especially in all the sensitive applications. And we're also investigating how we can get rid of unsafe evil uh, we basically have it in uh, some core libraries that are loaded almost everywhere, so we cannot uh, remove it at the moment, but we're trying to, you know, to change that. And also in some places we are experimenting if we can get rid of uh, strict dynamic, but uh, that's very hard uh, and only works in some cases. Uh, we have a couple of cool tools uh, that we use also internally and that are open sourced and uh, externally available. Is a, the CSP evaluator. You basically paste the content security policy and it tells you if that policy is useful to uh, mitigate cross-site scripting. If there's anything red, it's usually a bad sign. And internally, we also have uh, very powerful tools that basically monitor the CSP coverage of outgoing traffic that you know crunch together like the, the millions of CSP reports we receive, uh, deduplicate them and provide like actionable items for developers especially in the rollout phase to remove CSP blockers like inline event handlers or, you know, if someone forgot to nonce a script or something like that. And with that, I'm handing over to Miki to talk about sub-resource integrity. Awesome. Uh, so that was CSP, right? It was the, 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 the top mitigation against cross-site scripting. Uh, we'd like to uh, introduce you some other mitigations that are part of the web platform. Uh, not all of them are uh, implemented, and I would say which browser support which, uh, but they are very interesting and some are very low effort to uh, implement in uh, your websites. And so we would really like to see some, the adoption of some of them to actually uh, increase in the wild. So for example, one uh, such example of, uh, of an easy uh, mitigation to adopt is sub-resource sub integ integrity or SRI. Basically, a lot of websites um, have to source external scripts uh, with a script tag from a third party, usually a CDN. Um, and the problem with that is that you are executing in your web origin uh, basically untrusted JavaScript, right? You, you, you trust it, but uh, if, for example, the CDN gets hacked, the content of that JavaScript uh, can change and can become malicious, and this is a vector for, uh, for example, large-scale attacks or web worms. Uh, this has happened in the past, uh, and um, a very simple mitigation against that is having some kind of integrity check of the content of uh, JavaScript that you are including. So, uh, in supported, uh, supporting browsers, um, um, we'll have a table about that. It's as easy as adding an integrity tag, um, sorry, um, attribute to the script tag. You just do integrity and the SHA 
um, um, uh, hash of the uh, content of the JavaScript file you're including. So there are um, tools to, um, to compute the hash. Uh, you can go to, for example, srihash.org, or you just uh, Google or Bing um, uh, SRI hash generator. Uh, and uh, cross origin anonymous is actually not part of uh, SRI. It's part of a uh, core specification, just means that the XHR, XHR does not send credentials because you, you also want that extra uh, bit. Uh, so nowadays, if you look at, for example, jQuery, uh, not like jQuery um, official web page, uh, it will automatically ask you to copy paste a tag that has uh, SRI, which is really cool. Uh, we'd like to see this uh, more adopted in the wild because it's a very easy way of uh, stopping uh, these kind of attacks. Um, so browser support for SRE is pretty good. Uh, I would say all real browsers support it. Uh, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, uh, and New Edge. Uh, so that's, uh, and of course it uh, degrades uh, gracefully for uh, old browsers. So basically um, it just gets ignored. It's an attribute that gets ignored. So there's uh, no drawback to actually use it. Think site cookies are a very interesting mitigation ag against cross-site request forgery. So uh, in, in cross-site request forgery uh, attacks, um, basically when a, an attacker tricks the browser to send an authenticated request to a vulnerable website, the problem is that that request is authenticated. So it's sent along with the cookies of the user, even if the navigation is across sites, right? Uh, so it is from the embedding, let's say, evil.com that has an image or a form to vulnerablebank.com. And um, the idea is, what if developers could restrict cookies to actually be sent only if they, there is no cross-site navigation? So only if, na only if the navigation is same site. And the idea is to uh, add a flag to the cookie called same site uh, that could have two values, uh, strict and lax. Um, if you use strict, cookie, cookies are never sent when there is cross-site navigation. When there is lax, cookies are not sent when there is cross-site navigation and there is an unsafe um, HTTP method such as post. post. This means that, for example, if you receive an email on your Gmail or Yahoo Mail and you click on it, uh, this is a GET request, right? And if you use strict, you would not send cookies at all. So, for example, your, your session would kind of disappear. So this might be surprising to some users. So you have to wait uh, the two, uh, the two uh, levels of security that strict and lax give. Uh, if you really have all the uh, side of the, the actions with side effects that has a uh, post or put or whatever, uh, then you can use lax, but uh, the best would be to use strict. Uh, but then you have to take care into that. Basically, uh, links, external links, external navigation uh, will have the user not logged in when they uh, jump on to, in your website. The support for some uh, same site cookie is a little bit more limited. Firefox just adopted adopted it, which is great news. Uh, Chrome has it for a couple of major versions, and unfortunately, there is no Safari nor Edge uh, support. Let's talk about something different: site isolation, CORB, and from origin. So. This steps uh, um, out of the, the, the pure web world. This is not uh, against web vulnerabilities, not against cross-site scripting or cross-site request forgery. Uh, it is um, mostly against, uh, let's say, more low-level attacks. It is uh, ensuring that pages from different websites get rendered into different processes in the operating system. Uh, this is done to isolate the renderer process in Chromium. Uh, here we are mostly talking about Chromium only. This is a, uh, because it's pretty much design uh, dependent. Um, other browsers have a different way of uh, using a renderer process, don't have a renderer process, or they have it uh, um, in, a, in a different way, while Chromium uh, it has a renderer process and then has sandboxes. Uh, this goes one step further and basically says uh, all the data, ideally, of one website has to be constrained and limited to uh, one process. Um, it also blocks uh, pro the process from receiving sensitive data from other sites in, with some techniques. 
Um, this can be enabled uh, as a Chrome flag. Um, you do Chrome flags and then you search for a strict site isolation and you enable it. Uh, it's not enabled by default. Uh, it m will be probably in a while. Uh, it's not enabled by default because it uh, used to break a very, very, very small percentage of websites. Mostly they were very plugin heavy. They had external plugins for their, uh, their working and they, they, they were not compatible with this uh, strict process isolation. So uh, why am I bringing this up like now? Like this is a, um, so it might be surprising, right? Chrome has pretty good security already with Sandbox. Why we need extra isolation? Well, uh, you might have heard of Spectre and Meltdown uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, this uh, makes exploitation uh, on the web of especially Spectre uh, vulnerability much, much harder. Um, uh, th there are some theoretical uh, ex exploits that um, try to put uh, some attacker controlled payloads uh, either as a resource such as an image or uh, as a <clears throat> document like HTML uh, in the context of a page and then try to exfiltrate it uh, by exploiting the uh, speculative attack of uh, Spectre. Uh, so this became, this was uh, reprioritized and this became more important. So you might have, have read somewhere uh, if you use Chrome enables uh, strict site isolation to protect against uh, Spectre. Uh, what is CORB? Uh, CORB is an uh, important part of site isolation that uh, basically um, <clears throat> restricts which cross-origin data is sent to a renderer process or a process, limiting the access to such data. Um, a, an example is, for example, um, if an attacker, as I said, tries to um, load a document like an HTML file that he controls uh, in an image tag, uh, that would be uh, blocked with uh, with corb uh, this is um, uh, as i said before mostly for mitigating uh, against speculative side side channel attacks like spectra uh, this is uh, this will be enabled by default it will be part of site isolation when uh, site isolation is enabled there is another proposal that is actually pretty um, old proposal that's now has regained steam uh, it's called from origin uh, from origin very simply put, it's, it's, this is delivered with a header. So the, the two I said before, strict site isolation is a setting in the browser. This is a header, like content security policy, like uh, uh, well, the, the ones we'll see later. So from origin, basically a webmaster can put from origin to uh, all the documents or the resources to uh, prevent, prevent them from being loaded and included by known whitelisted origins. So I have a lot of images and I don't want these images to be loaded from whatever.com. So, um, yes, sure, this mitigates inline linking, like there are even some attacks, uh, where bandwidth, leeching, uh, these kind of, of things. Uh, you could uh, uh, inflate the bill, the hosting bill of someone by just including in some high traffic forum or, so, or fortune, uh, like uh, all the heaviest resources that you have. Uh, but uh, this goes even further in mitigating attacks such as Spectre. Uh, so uh, it is... A, interesting um, extra that is in the hands of uh, web developers to restrict uh, basically all the resources uh, from being loaded from outside. So uh, here are some upcoming mitigations that are not implemented yet, uh, but that we would uh, really like to, to see happening soon. And um, uh, yeah, this needs, of course, um, Mm, uh, let's say a uh, full consensus from the, the community, the industry, uh, W3, and every uh, every other actor. Um, the first is suborigins. So uh, suborigins are a pretty um, extensive and um, controversial, maybe, uh, topic from an implementation point of view, mostly not from a concept point of view. Uh, the idea is to uh, subdivide what, the concept of web origin in a more granular way uh, by adding to the web origin tuple, which is scheme, host, and port, like HTTPS, Google, uh, 443, uh, and a namespace that is provided by the webmaster, like um, accounts or user one. Uh, this makes, makes it possible to uh, isolate different applications that are running in the same web origins um, by um, not having to have you know, a subdomain or a different domain. So there are some cool um, pro applications of suborigins like per user origins. 
uh, this would be uh, ex they would provide extremely high security, uh, both for cookies, for basically everything. You know, web origins are the foundation of web security. Uh, we rely on them. Making the concept of origin more uh, fine grained uh, just uh, automatically makes a lot of uh, things uh, attacks harder and a lot of things more secure. Of course, it also makes uh, it could create some problems. Um, can be used to segregate user content from the main origin. Uh, let's say that, uh, okay, so if you have user content, you should really use a, another domain, right? Like googleusercontent.com or uh, uh, githubcontent.com or the .io. But let's say you really can't and you have slash user content slash. Um, uh, well, then in theory, you could use sub-origins to uh, make it so it's exactly like it was another origin. So that's very powerful. Uh, another idea is sometimes um, you have sensitive functionalities on the same origin, like slash admin, uh, WP admin is WordPress admin, right? Um, you don't want usually uh, um, to be on the same origin of the main content, especially if you allow user content, uh, you allow user uploads and so on. Uh, this would um, uh, make it possible to isolate such sensitive uh, functionalities easier. So um, adopting sub-origins um, might require and, uh, some refactoring of existing uh, web applications. Uh, this is because there, uh, there uh, come to be more co communication types. Um, sub-origin to sub-origin, uh, sub-origin to the, let's say, parent origin, and sub-origin to an external origin. So in case of communication sub-origin to sub-origin, well, then the uh, receiving or, well, the other page, the other uh, document should just have declared the same sub-origin via sub-origin header. So this, uh, this makes it them uh, both part of the same sub-origin and everything works. Uh, if you have, if you want to communicate to the parent origin or to, to the origin in general, then you need uh, the origin page receiver or sender, let's say endpoint, to add access control allow sub-origin, which is a new header. There is access control allow origin, right? But there will be allow sub-origin. Maybe. This is not set in stone, of course, this is being discussed. And sub-origin to extern, uh, you, the, the uh, other endpoint should have access control allow origin. So um, here I would like to demo, sorry, uh, I'd like to demo um, a Chrome extension uh, that we created um, an intern in our team, Elena Ionescu, uh, called the Suboriginator. Uh, that it's uh, good for uh, testing and prototyping suborigins. So basically, says if the website you are testing would work out of the box with suborigins, or if it needs uh, modifications and uh, which ones. So um, yes, let's go. Um, we have this problem at Google. Um, we have some um, Google services that are for mostly for historical reasons on the main domain of Google, www.google.com. Uh, of course, www is a very sensitive domain. And um, let's go to www.google.com slash about. Okay, uh, this is um, some, these are some static web pages uh, that are, um, Mm, updated uh, frequently, and they uh, often use a um, different technology stack of what we use uh, for our products. Uh, this means that uh, there is a potential for them to have some vulnerabilities we are not aware of and maybe we would not have on other products. And by being on the same origin, uh, this means that this a vulnerability, an XSS, for example, in, uh, in, the, in uh, these static pages would be as bad as having it in a uh, major web application or in uh, in the account area. Um, this is of course a problem. So let's see how it works. Uh, we uh, open the uh, suboriginator extension. We uh, put about as the target site and we start it. Right here we have a warning that suboriginator is de debugging this browser, and uh, we just browse around a little bit. That's. Uh, blog post about using machine learning to help stop deforestation. And um, let's just try to exercise the UI a little bit. Let's move this eye. Yeah, it's cool. 
and uh, let's stop it and see the report. So these are the reported cross-origin requests. There are only sub-origin to sub-origin requests. So some MP3 files have been requested, then a video, and um, yeah, audio again, a TXT file. So as you can see, like a lot of resources have been requested, but they could be part of the same sub-origin. So this means that it is as easy as adding the same sub-origin. We could be about, for example, right? Um, this means that basically this works out of the box. We don't see sub-origin to origin, we don't see sub-origin to extern. That would need to be refactored. So this is very promising, and uh, this means that, that this would be pretty easy to implement. So let's stop this and let's go to another um, Google product. It actually redirected to search immediately. Just a second. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Google Finance is uh, becoming integrated with Google Search, and it's still on dub dub dub. So let's do the same. Let's open the sub originator and do dub 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 google dot com finance. We start it. Uh, let's um, go around li a little bit. This uh, would probably go out because yes, these are direct uh, links to. Yeah, we can. Uh, Reload it and uh, let's go to, uh, yeah, this is still finance. This is still finance. Okay, these are the indices, local market news, world market. Let's see what Subordinator has to say. So in this case, we have a little bit more results. Uh, we see there are some suborigin to origin. This means that um, there are some requests from finance to the parent dub 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 slash something else. Uh, you, we can see, for example, here, uh, this is, um, well, uh, probably some kind of JSON. Uh, this is, um, yeah, this is probably all uh, XHR-like uh, things. Uh, this means that being a sub-origin to origin, uh, the origin would need to add the access control allow sub-origin, like if it were, it was, um, if it were a um, cross-site uh, request, right, like with course. And uh, sub-origin to external, so we are playing, we are, this uh, we are um, sourcing content, loading content from play.google.com and ogs.google.com. Uh, this is mostly because of the bar. This is for the notification count of the bar on the top. So this will require uh, not only modifications on finance, but also on these domains uh, to add uh, access control allow origin and access control allow sub origin. But this kind of tool, uh, in my opinion, is very interesting. Uh, this is not open source yet. Uh, we uh, need to, so this is very dependent on some, um, uh, l let's say, um, uh, hard to update and to keep updated uh, features of the Chrome API, Chromium API. Uh, so uh, we, um, we, we consider um, creating an external version of this um, uh, in the future. And, uh, but we wanted to, to show you uh, a preview of uh, what we have internally um, for prototyping uh, such, a, um, such a technology. And um, suborigins are being discussed uh, by W3, and um, uh, the, there is some some agreement, some something uh, on something uh, people agree on something people uh, people agree less, and uh, we really hope to to see this uh, working and being implemented in browsers soon. Origin policy is another uh, proposal. Um, it basically pins uh, policies such as the content security policy or referral policy to an entire origin. So this complements header-based delivery and uh, increases coverage by making it the default. So uh, it's a little bit like uh, in HSTS, like mandating HTTPS on a whole origin. Uh, it, it actually says uh, mm, for the first time you query, uh, you, you get a page from, from that origin, it says uh, there is a manifest and it says, uh, please apply these headers, these policies, automatically for the whole origin. Uh, so this is very good because sometimes uh, there are different technology stacks and the coverage of, for example, content security policy is not perfect. Like maybe you have some kind of routing to, um, 
let's say an error page or something like that that it's not completely in your in your control uh, i don't know you have some weird load balancer uh, that goes externally you have f5 these kind of things and <clears throat> this this makes it uh, the default so it assur assures you that you have good coverage uh, this is also being uh, discussed feature policy which is also at a proposal stage um, allows the administrative web admin to uh, selectively enable and disable different browser features and web APIs. So uh, the idea is uh, you can say on my website, on my uh, website, I don't want people to, uh, I don't, I don't want to allow browsers to go full screen. I want to disable web USB on these pages because I don't use it uh, or so on. Uh, an example is in combination with origin policy, you can restrict geolocation API, like the ones to get the location, to a particular page, thus reducing the attack surface in case of an access on the domain. So uh, we usually, uh, as, as Lucas said before, we usually, usually don't think about the post XSS, like once you have code execu JavaScript code execution, usually you can bypass all the mitigations. Uh, this would be one of those rare cases where this in combination with origin policy could actually reduce the capabilities of an attacker once they got uh, XSS, because they couldn't, for example, exfiltrate the user position. Uh, we're done, I think, a little bit earlier. Uh, Hope you liked it, and if you have any questions. So we are opening questions on the floor. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Lucas and Michele. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you.